But we now have the opportunity to continue our worship through the study and the listening to God's Word. So if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll be in this section for our morning sermon. It's going to be from verses 17 through 24. Let's turn to it together. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17 through 24, speaking on contentment. Let's read this together. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised and him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision? Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a free man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You are bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let there him remain with God. Let's bow in the word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this morning sermon, the morning passage in which we're going to look at. The fact that no matter where we're at in our lives, we could be content, that we could seek after you, could live for you in that very specific life that which you have assigned us. Help us, Lord, to learn the principles this morning. What does it mean to live for you in the lives which you've given? We thank you, Lord, for that, and we pray that we would grow tremendously as a result of understanding your word this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What will be the one thing that you would change about yourself? If you're honest with yourself, you're listening to this question, you probably could think of that one thing. That one thing probably has been on your mind for a season already. You thought, if I just get rid of this one thing, or if I just change this one thing about me, my destiny would be changed. My life would be so much better if this one thing did not exist, or if this one thing was real in my life. Many people were asked this question, and some people answered this question, and a survey was going out, and people say, well, you know what? I would like to change my appearance. I'd like to be taller, I think that if I was taller, and certainly I would be afforded a better opportunity in life, people would look up to me more. Or I want to be shorter because I feel like I'm too tall, I'm missing out on everybody. Some people say I want to be more muscular. Some people say I want to lose weight. We want to change our appearance. Some people then say, well, perhaps I want to change my education. I want to know more things. I want to be educated in this and that. I wish I spent more time in school. I wish that I pursued this career so that I wouldn't have to be in this kind of a job, but in that kind of a job. If I had done that, then my life would have been better. Some people say, well, I wish that my mental state is better. I wish that I don't have to struggle with depression. I wish that I don't have to struggle with anxiety. So if I had these things removed from my life, then my life would have been better. Others say, I wish I could change my personality. I wish I'm not so prone to frustration, so prone to being flustered in life, so prone to be angered in life. If I had that thing removed from my life, then I would have a better life. So, because we believe that our destiny depends on the change of these external appearances or external behavior, we work hard to change those things. We go to the doctor, we want to change the way we think. We go to the psychiatrist. We want to change the way we feel. We go to school. We want to change our education, the way that we understand different things. We exercise. We work hard. We play basketball, whatever it is. We want to change the way that we look on the outside. We lift weights. We spend tremendous amount of time seeking to change the things that we believe will alter our destiny. However, the reality is that our God actually perceives us differently because our God actually is looking for something in us perhaps we don't even notice or never even thought of as important. We're thinking about changing these external things, but what God looks at is our hearts. According to 1 Samuel chapter 16, 
God has commanded this particular person called Samuel to go look for a king, a particular king, a king which will rule over Israel. And Samuel, Samuel saw this man, a man named Eliab, one of Jesse's sons. And he was excited about this man because this man was tall. This man was perhaps handsome, looks like a king. And Samuel says, this got to be the king. This man's got everything externally. And by the way, he looks, perhaps even by the way he carries himself, he has the charisma to be the king. But this is what God said to Samuel in Samuel chapter 1, verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 7. He said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God says, I have certain plans for certain individuals. And man might think, only if I had this, I would have this destiny. I would have this future. But God says, you know what? I'm the determinator of every person's destiny. And from my determination, what I look at, what I look at an individual, I look at not on his outward appearance or his outward behavior, but I look at his heart. What is he passionate about? Namely, he must be passionate about following God. In that sense, God chose David to be the next king. Now, for all of us, we seek to be this man. How do we perceive ourselves in such a way that that most important thing which we need to change, the most important thing which we need to have, be that very thing which God desires or God wants us to have? How do we have that at heart attitude? Well, we may when we understand what God values. Our God values one thing, the very thing that sets himself apart from us, namely his holiness, his purity, and his righteousness. God is holy and pure, and there's no one like him, according to the Psalms. And he created us to be holy and pure. We're meant to be holy and pure before God. However, we sin against God, as we saw in the beginning chapters of Genesis. We walked away from God. We chose to allow sin to come to our lives. We chose to disobey God's commandments. As a result of that, sin came into the world. Sin ruined the world. There is that hurtful action, that hurtful word that is in the world that destroys this world. And it's because of us. And our God is deeply dissatisfied with the world as it is today. So therefore, he must judge the world because he's the holy and the righteous God. However, our God is also a God of love, a God of patience, a God of kindness. He knows what needed to be changed in order for this world to be saved and to be brought back to him, and that is we need to be rescued from our sins. So therefore, he sent his son Jesus to earth. Jesus came to do one thing, namely to rid of sin from this world. He came and gave his life for us. He lived that perfect life which we could not have lived. And he gave his perfect righteousness to us. He died on the cross to pay for the punishment that is due us for our sins. We would be judged by God for our sins, except that Jesus took that punishment. And he rose again from the dead to show us that he had triumphed over sin. That he will live forever in the presence of his Father. And we, if we follow him, we will live in the forever presence of God as well. We will triumph over sin as a result of following Christ Jesus. In this very lesson, in this very understanding of the most important change that we need to have in our lives, if we believe unto this, we will begin to have a shifted perception of where our next step should be in our lives. A lot of times we think, well, the next step is for me to get married. The next step is for me to get educated in this college. The next step is for me to get a career in this job setting. But God says, no, that's not your next step. Your next step is to follow Jesus and you live your life wholly unto him. If your life is transformed as a result of following God, your steps will be led by God according to his will. Where to, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, to not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds, so that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, his good and acceptable and perfect will. And so we are to focus on what God wants us to change, and namely, 
changing and growing our holiness. And if we're growing our holiness, God will lead us to our next steps. Or if God doesn't lead us to change in the state of our lives, whether being single, whether being married, whether being in this job, or whether being living in this location, we're still okay with it because ultimately we can glorify God in our very state. This is a lesson here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, uh, 17, 24. God is teaching us how can we be content seeking after the Lord and rejoicing in Christ in the very state of life which God has called us to be in. You can. In the very state which God has called you to be in, you could rejoice, you could seek after God, you could be content. There are two arenas, two arenas which God wants us to look at this morning in which we could be content and seeking after the Lord. First, the arena of our church life. The arena of our church life. Let's look at this in verse 17 to 20. It says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all churches. Was anyone at the time is called already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time is called uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. As we come to this passage, we're seeing Paul giving some specific instructions regarding the change of states in our lives. Now, Paul has been instructing the Corinthian church on various things, on various hard attitudes which they needed to have. He's been instructing the Corinthian church on being humble, they need to be humble before others and before the Lord. He's been instructing the Corinthian church on sexuality, how they should function in the sexuality, whether they're single or married. If they're single and to wait upon the expression of that. If they're married, they're to fulfill that within the spousal relationships. Whatever it is that they do, they need to honor God with their bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have before God. You're not your own. You are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So God is calling the Corinthian church to glorify God in, the every, in every state of their lives, whether they're being single or they're being married. They're to glorify God by living for God in their bodies. Now with that, Apostle Paul gives to the Corinthian church some benefits, some advantages, some blessings of either life. If you're married, you have some blessings in your life. If you're single, you have some blessings in your life. First of all, he says, if you're married, you're blessed. Because when you're married, you get to experience that intimate relationship between two people. This is who God designed for us to be in the very beginning, Adam and Eve. We get to experience that intimate relationship between a person whom we love. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, it says this. When God first created Adam, the Lord God said, it is not good that man shall be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So God looked at Adam and said, Adam's alone. It's not good that he should be alone because he desires a companion. So what I would do is I will make a companion for Adam. When Adam saw the companion in Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 to 23, he said, wow. He said this. Actually, in the beginning, he said, the Lord God made man for man, a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. And the man said, Wow. That at last is the bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I'm going to enjoy this intimate relationship with the woman who you have given to me. I'm blessed. And this is God's blessing for those who are married. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 says this, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. We're to rejoice in that married relationship. So if you're married today, enjoy that. This is what God's called us to do. God's called us to fulfill the blessings of marriage. But if you're single today, there's also tremendous blessing in that as well. You get to serve God. You get to be undistracted serving the Lord. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, To the Mary and to the widow, I say, that it's good for them to remain single as I am. Paul said, I, I love being single. I get to travel the world, I get to travel the Mediterranean world, I get to share the gospel, I get to be untied with anybody who might be a spouse. And Paul, perhaps at the point in his life, was married because he was a Sanhedrin, but his wife probably left him or died. He's single right now. He says, I love my life. I don't want to be married. I don't ever consider being married. I think this is a good way to live my life for the rest of my life. This might be the feeling of some of us here. We love the way that we're living right now, so we're not 
wanting to get married. And Paul says, this is fine. This is a good life that you have chosen. You get to serve the Lord with full commitment. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32 to 34, Paul says this, I want you to be free from anxieties. That a married man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but a married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. His interests are divided. Paul says you don't have to have this in your life. You don't have to have divided interests. You can simply serve the Lord from a full commitment of a single person. So if you have this life, embrace it. It's a wonderful life for you to live. Now, in that sense, Paul says, whether you're married and whether you're single, you're to be content in the Lord. For us, we don't really get to decide which one we're going to be. If you're single, you're born single. If you're married, it's the blessings of God. God has led you to that person. So in that sense, Paul said in verse 17, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. And this is what my rule in all the churches. He says, whatever God's called you, whatever God's assigned to you, this is the life that I want you to focus on, living it for the glory of God. If God's called you to be single, consider staying single. Don't think about what I'm going to do when I'm married. Some people think, you know what, I, I'm meant to be a mom. I'm meant to be a wife, so I'm going to just stay back and do nothing until I am a mom. You're going to wait for a while. Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. Serve God the way you are. Some people say, well, you know what? I'm married to this deadbeat husband, and I can't serve God in any way. I'm just waiting for this person to go away in my life. Paul says, don't. Consider that. Serve God the way which you are today. Whatever life God's given to you, whatever life God's assigned to you, live it fully for the glory of God. And we talked about this last week, too. If you're remarried or married to somebody, and you don't like the spouse, whether it be a person who is an unbeliever or a person who you regret marrying, God says, stay in that marriage. Stay in that marriage. Consider that marriage to be permanent and glorify God in it. In that very sense, Paul says, be content. God can use you in a circumstance which you are in for his glory, no matter how you arrive at that circumstance. If you're single, if you're married, if you're remarried, whatever condition you're remarried, it doesn't matter. Be who you are and let God use you in that condition. So God says this in verse 18, and he gives an illustration about circumcision. And this is, a circum this is an illustration many of us think, well, it's kind of out of the blue, but for the Jews back then, for the Greeks back, Greeks back then, the Gentiles back then, they actually had to deal with this quite a bit. So Paul says this as an illustration. He said, verse 18, Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. So you have this illustration regarding circumcision. Circumcision was a removal of a piece of skin from a male anatomy when the male or when the baby is about eight months old. And so you, I mean, eight days old. And so you remove this skin in demonstration of the fact that you are the people of God. Remove this skin is a sign of the fact that you belong to God. This is seen in Exodus chapter 17, verse 10 through 12, where God commanded Abraham this. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. He shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So God says this to Abraham, I want all the Jews who are my people to be circumcised. And ultimately, this is a sign of the fact that you are my people. Now, God doesn't really care about physical circumcision. He doesn't. Whether you have that piece of skin in your, on your body or not, God really does not care because what God looks at is the heart. Amen. This is a symbol of a transformed heart. This is seen exact, uh, exactly in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, when God commanded Israelites this, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. God says you need to remove the foreskin of your heart so that your heart is sensitive to the commandments of God. Do not be stubborn. Do not do things your way, but be attentive to the ways of God. Be always tender to God's commandments in your life. This is what circumcision is to do to the heart. 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 15 speaks of the same thing from the Apostle Paul, in which he says, Neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. As long as you're created by God in the sense of being created to live for God in your new being, you're saved, you're born again. It does not matter you're circumcised or not. It doesn't matter. So what Paul says is this. Was anyone, in verse 18, in time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. You see, in the Jewish world, in the, in the Gentile world, there's a clash. Jewish world is normally in Israel. The Gentile world is rest of the Roman colonies. And what they would do is that the Jews would travel to the Gentile world, and they would find themselves to be a foreigner in the Gentile world. And what they have in those days are public baths. In public baths, you would get naked, you would take a bath, and everybody could see whether you're circumcised or not. And when they see that you're not circumcised or see that you're circumcised, people will have certain judgment about you. They might think you're a stuck-up Jew. They might think that you are dirty Gentile. Whatever way that they would think of you, you might think to change yourself so that you would fit other people's expectation of you. That was a temptation. So if you're a Jewish person, you're already circumcised. You go to the Gentile world. You're part of the Gentile church. And the men are coming together and taking a public bath together. And they see that you're circumcised. They say, you know what? You're not part of us. And so you're tempted to do a surgery that will undo the circumcision. There was an actual surgery for that. And Paul says, you know what? I don't want you to do this. It's not a good surgery. If you look it up, it's not a good surgery. Don't do it. It's also not a good surgery for you spiritually because now you are seeking to live under the expectation of men. It's going to trap you in your thought process. So don't allow this thought process come to your mind. Whoever you are is who you are. And then Paul said also in verse 18, was anyone at the time was called uncircumcised, let him not seek circumcision. So there are Gentiles that got saved, and now they're traveling to Israel. They're looking at all the beauty of Israel, all the buildings and all the traditions and all the laws, and say, you know what, I want to live like a Jew. Again, they go to the public path, and they see all the Jews are there, and the Jews are looking at them, and they're saying, you know what, I want to look like you. And so they want to be accepted by the people who are there. So they want to get circumcised, and Paul says, don't do it. Don't do it to please men. Don't do it as a matter of pleasing others because you in who you are is good before God. You don't have to change. You can glorify God in your body. Verse 19, Paul says, there's neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. It's who you are on the inside that truly matters. You don't have to change to fit in. You don't have to make yourself different. You don't have to express yourself differently to fit in to other people's expectation. You could be who you are. So therefore, in verse 20, Paul says this, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Be who you are. Now, I think for a diverse church like this, diverse church like us, we could do that because I'm happy for our church because in our church, you literally can find everybody in every condition of life. This is Hollywood. It's wonderful. So nobody has to feel left out because we're all different from each other. But if you go to a church where people are the same, certainly you could feel tempted to want to look like them. You know, I used to be part of a church that I was planting and I was a pastor of. I used to be part of a church in which I was ministering to gang members. And a lot of gang members were coming to Christ. A lot of gang members were in Christ and they came to our church and they were telling the stories. I don't know if it might not be something that relatable to you, but you, you would have stories I wouldn't be related to, but I want to tell you a story which happened to me. People were sharing these stories. They're saying, you know, I got shot like this time. I got stabbed this time. And I was doing this. I was doing that. And I got saved in jail. People literally have war stories how they came to know Christ. And I was pastoring them. I'm thinking, you know what? I kind of want to have a war story on my own, you know? Like my conversion story basically is that I got saved because my mom told me the gospel. I felt that I was a sinner. I repented before God and got saved. Amen. And that was it. But it was not a war story. But you see, I need to be content in the way which God saved me. I need to be happy in that. I need to not change because other people are doing this. I could live my life the way God called us to be. In a way, a matter of singleness and married as well. This is the context of this passage. You can walk into the church and everybody's married. Or everybody's single, right? If you walk into the church and say everybody's married, for example, that. And you're thinking, you know what, I need to be married. And people are pressuring you. You know, why don't you ask this person out? Why don't you ask that person out? You're like, you know what, it's a little tiring, okay? I don't have to. Maybe I did, but I got rejected, so I don't want to tell everybody. So therefore, you're thinking, you know what, I just want to be who I am. Be who you are. 
Be who you are. Nobody should be pressured to change their external behavior or external status because this is what fits in with the rest of the people. No, you should be exactly who you are because you can worship God, you can glorify God in your very state currently. So in that sense, Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13 regarding contentment. He says this, not that I'm speaking of being in need, nor, oh, not to speak of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation to be what? Content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. I know how in every circumstance the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can live any kind of life that God calls me to live. I can live as a single person. I can live as a married person. I can live whatever life God's called me to live. I am content. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18 says this, we're to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Whatever circumstance we're in, we're to rejoice, we're to pray, we're to give thanks for God for. However we arrive there, wherever we're at, we can serve God and glorify God in the way that we are within the church setting. We don't have to pressure each other. We're not going to pressure each other to be single. We're not going to pressure each other to be married. We're not going to pressure each other to have this perception they need to have in order to fit in. No, you could be who you are. Be comfortable in who you are and glorify God in who you are. This is what we as a church need to be. Not only so, not only would you be content seeking the Lord in our church life, we're also to be content seeking the Lord in our secular life, in our work life. We're going to see this in verse 21, 24. Again, we continue. Paul says, Were your bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bond servant is a free man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. You are brought, bought with a price, do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain there with God. So Paul here gives another illustration. Another illustration that is not just within the church life, but actually within our secular life, namely the life of being a servant, the life of being a bondservant. Now, if we look at the Roman Empire, we know servants are everywhere. In fact, most people are servants. Actually, more than about half of the people there are servants. 40 to 50 percent, maybe even more, are servants. Servants are not necessarily what we think in American slavery as servants or slaves, but rather they're more of an employee under employer relationship. They're more consensual relationship, more of a contractual relationship in that Roman Empire than there is in American slavery, which is man stealing, which is not of God. But here in the Roman Empire, there's a contract between this person and that person that I will work for you, and people actually can buy themselves out, out of slavery. They can actually remove themselves out of that servanthood if they fulfill their contract, as we see later on in verse 21. Some people can veil themselves out of that servanthood. Now, servants are not necessarily people who are unskilled. They could be people who are doctors. They could be people who are, who are engineers, people who are architects, people who are artists, people who are musicians, people who are teachers. They are just choosing to work another, under another person. So in that sense, many of us will be considered servants because we choose to work for another person. We're not out there freelancing on our own. We're not out there being our own CEO. We're choosing to work for another person. So we are servants, and that is fine. Paul says if you're a servant... Your servant. Again, this is not American way of slavery. Some people look at the Bible and says, well, Bible condones slavery. It does not. Because American way of slavery is man stealing. It's literally saying you have no say and no right to declare your own freedom. I'm going to just buy you. I'm going to work you to this way. And you have no say. That's American slavery. That is not what the Bible is teaching. Exodus, for example, chapter 21, verse 16 says this, Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. That's what American slavery is all about. It's about stealing a man and selling a man. So the Bible never condones American slavery, chattel slavery, that is. But in this kind of slave master, servant master setting, the Bible says that it is something that you can do as a reflection of you giving glory to God for your lives. Now, you may be a servant, and so your contract may be over. So you're working for this master for a certain amount of time, and say three years, five years, and now your contract is over, and the master says you're free to go. 
I don't have to take care of you anymore. I don't have to feed you anymore. I don't have to house you anymore. And you can go out there and do your own work, be your own CEO, be your own free man. But the servant may say, you know what? I don't really want to go out there and face the conditions of this world on my own. I want to work for you, master. And the master, if he agrees and says, you know what? That's fine. You can work for me. From now on, you're called a bond servant. So there's a difference between a servant and a bond servant. A servant is someone who's under contractual relationship. A bond servant is one who says to the master, I'm going to work for you for life as a volunteer, as a voluntary, on a voluntary basis of my decision. I volunteer to do so. This is actually saying in Exodus chapter 21, verse 5 through 6, where it says, If the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go all free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and shall bring him to the door of the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an owl, and he shall be his slave forever. So the slave says, you know what? I don't want to go out. I want to be my master, be with my master forever. I want to be the servant of my master forever. So the master would do, says, okay, if you want to do that, that's fine. Let's, take, let's go to the doorpost. And literally puts his ear to the doorpost and stick a needle through the ear of this Man, and now this man belongs to the master forever. He's going to ser serve the master forever. So I want this. I enjoy this. I want to be with you. It's a voluntary decision from the slave. Now, you're a bond servant. The question is, what if you are a bond servant and now you're called by God? We see this in verse 20, 21. Were you a bond servant when called? You committed yourself to his master. But now Apostle Paul comes and shares the gospel with you. You're like, you know what? I, I'm, I changed my mind. I want to go out to the mission field with Apostle Paul. I want to live my life in such a way I'm free so that I could be free not to serve this master who I love, which is a great life. But now I think there is a, a further opportunity for me, a better opportunity for me. I can actually go out there and serve the Lord. I could travel. I could journey. I could share the gospel in different cities. I don't want to stay with one person forever anymore. Paul says in verse 21, if you could do so, do so. Avail yourself of the opportunity. Right? Verse 21, if you gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Go ahead and gain your freedom. But if you don't choose to do so, if you cannot, don't worry about it. Verse 21, do not be concerned about it. You actually can live for God in the state which you are in. Again, the same principle. You don't have to change your external behavior, your external state for the glory of God. You can be who you are and serve God exactly as you are. Ultimately, the principle is laid out in verse 22. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a free man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free is called, who is called is a bondservant of Christ. It doesn't matter if you're free. It doesn't matter if you're a bondservant. Your relationship in this world, your relationship, uh, how you assess yourself is based on your relationship with God and God alone. You're free. Or first of all, you're a bondservant. You truly are free. You're serving under a bondservant. You're serving under, as a bondservant. You're serving under a master. You're free because Christ Jesus saved you. You're free from sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 18 says this, We have been set free from sin and we have become slaves of righteousness. We're no longer to serve men. We're no longer afraid of men. Psalm chapter 118 verse 6 says this, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Even though you serve under an employer, you're not fear of an employer. The employer may not be happy with you, but you know what? It's, it's too bad I serve the Lord. You can fire me. I'll find another job. I don't have to serve men. But ultimately, what I do is I serve the Lord, right? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6 says this. We're serving under our employer, not by the way of eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. We're doing the will of God from the heart. We're ultimately serving God. Now, on the other hand, you might be free. You might be, you know, I'm free. I'm not a bond servant anymore, and uh, I'm actually an owner of a company. I employ other people. I'm free. I'm, I, I, I'm 40 years old. I'm already retired. I don't even have to work anymore. That's how free I am. And Paul says, what? You're free? Okay. You are a bond servant of Jesus still. It doesn't matter you're free in this world, but you're a bond servant of Christ. You still have to fulfill your obligations to God. You're serving a master. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, right, apostle, a slave, a servant. The, the word that he used, a bond servant. I'm a doulos. 
I'm a, I'm a person who I went to Jesus. I said to God, God, I want to serve you forever. And God literally took me to the doorpost and stuck a nail through my ear and said, you're my bond servant forever. Paul says, this is who I am. I'm a bond servant of God. James said the same thing. James chapter 1, verse 1. I am a slave of Jesus Christ. So you might be free in this world, but you still have to fulfill your obligations to the Lord. That means you still have to wake up early and read your Bible, right? That's your appointment with God. You still have to wake up early to pray. That's your appointment with God. You still have to go to church. You still have to serve. You still have to come to Bible study and learn more about Jesus. You might be a CEO somewhere earning millions of dollars to come to church. You're what? You're a brother. That's who you are. You are a brother, and that is it. You're not any bit higher, any bit lower. You're just a brother. You are serving the same Lord that we are serving. You're a bond servant of God. It's who you are. So in that sense, Paul says you don't have to be concerned about it. Be who you are. Verse 23, you're bought with a price, so therefore do not become bond servants of men. So whatever you do, in whatever condition you are called, verse 24, let him there remain with God. You don't have to change. Be content in who you are. Be content. I think about my job, right? My job as a pastor. Sometimes I go to these parties and neighborhood gatherings, and people come and invite me because, uh, you know, we were friendly with people in our neighborhood, and uh, they come invite me, and some believers who are there. And sometimes I would meet people who are artists. Some people, sometimes I meet people who are musicians. Sometimes I meet people who are actors. And people talk about what they do. And people come to me and ask me, what do I do? What do you think I say? I'm a pastor, right? I'm a pastor. And people already have this perception. Oh, oh okay. It's kind of surprising to them. It's like, they don't know what to say. They're kind of thinking, okay, if, I, if he says musician, I'm going to say this. They say artist, I'm going to say this. If he says uh, actor, I'm going to say this. Pastor is like, oh. Well, you know what? I'm not too sure what I have to say to that. I'm not too sure what I'm going to think about that, right? It's like you're one of those ones that stand in the street corners. What, what, what are you, right? What are you? So they begin to observe you. So like, oh, I don't know what to say. But you know what? They're thinking about it. So what I do now really matters. How I interact with them in my neighborhood really matters. Okay, that guy's a Christian. That guy's a pastor. And he represents God. So in that sense, my job is kind of sacred in that way. But that's not just for me. That's for all of us. Did you know that? All of us. Martin Luther once said, there is no difference between secular and sacred. There is none. There is no secular job. There is no sacred job. All job is sacred. All jobs are sacred. You can work a job, which you're an artist, you're a dent dental hygienist, you're, I don't know, you're an engineer, you're a musician, you're an actor, you are doing whatever thing that you're doing. But the moment, right, that you tell other people that you're a Christian, your job becomes sacred. Did you know that? Because people are looking at you. You go to the gathering and people say, oh, what do you do? Well, I'm artist, I'm this, I'm that. And it's like, well, I'm a, uh, and, and, and then what, what do you do during the week? Or what, what is your most uh, intense passion? Well, I'm a Christian. Oh, you're artist, but you're Christian. And all of a sudden, they're viewing you. Not so much that you're artist, not so much you're actor, not so much you're an engineer, but you are a Christian. And your job, you must demonstrate that because now your job, you're demonstrating the gospel of Christ. And people wondering, this is what the Christian does. This is how the gospel is. And so therefore, they're considering if they will believe in God with, or, uh, believe in God because of you or in spite of you or they will not believe in God because of you or in spite of you. Because you now are representing Christ. People are thinking about Christ through you. They are. They are. So all job is sacred. Well, you begin to tell people that you do it for the Lord. As A.W. Tozer said, it is not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It is why he does it. The motive is everything. Let a man sanctify the Lord God in his heart. He can thereafter do no uncommon act. You're not going to do any common act. You're not going to do any act that is common, that is only secular. Everything you do has spiritual consequence and influence inside of it. So therefore, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the Apostle Paul commands us to do this, that we're to eat or drink or whatever it is that we do, we're to do it all for the glory of God. You see, a lot of times we look at a church, a lot of times we're in this world, we're just thinking, you know what, the church is apart from the world, and the world is going down, the world is going to hell, the world is, is so bad, and this and that, and we're just going to point at it from a far away and say, you know what, that's what the church, that's what the world is, is going to hell, and then we're going to judge the world from far away. But God actually tells us that we need to do something more. In fact, we're to mix in with the world. 
We're to influence the world from within. This is exactly what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, in which he said, we are the salt of the earth. Salt is meant to what? Influence. Salt is meant to preserve. Salt is meant to flavor. Salt is meant to make something wonderful and good. And so when other people ask you, why do you do what you do? You did such a great job. What do you say? I did. Yep. Or do you say what? I did it because I'm motivated by my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And people begin to what? See Jesus in you. They begin to calculate you through the lens of Jesus Christ. In that sense, you're presenting Christ in your life. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16 says this also, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. You're letting your light shine in the very secular, quote-unquote, work which we do, in which now it becomes sacred and spiritual and this is seen in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. So in the end, when they see your good works, what do they do? So they may see your good works and give what? Glory to you? Glory to your Father who is in heaven. How did they know to do so? How did they know to give glory to God who is in heaven? Because you told them that the reason why you did it is because of the Lord. You had to tell them that. You could tell them you're a great actor. You can tell them that you do this and you make this music. You, you could, that's an icebreaker, sure. But ultimately, you have to tell them why you did what you did. You're doing it for the Lord so that when you do a good job, the glory goes not to you but to God. Amen. So in that sense, amen. So in that sense, you don't have to change. You could be who you are. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to a certain life that other people are leading in order to have God use you. God can use you in every state of your life, every state. In fact, God can use you oftentimes in the most difficult state of your life. I talk to people, people always say, you know what, this is so difficult. This is so hard what I'm going through right now. It must not be God's will. If I hit a dead end, that means that God doesn't want me to do it. Not necessarily. If you hit that dead end, it's hard. God may want you to stay in it and continue to battle through it. This is exactly what Apostle Paul does in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, when he was in a dead end, sort of, in his mission field. It was so hard, he said this, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which ourselves are comforted by God. Paul says this, just because you're in a hard place does not necessarily mean that God wants you to remove yourself from the hard place. God may glorify himself through you stay in the hard time so that he may show his grace and mercy in you and have you learn through that so that you may be able to comfort other people who are going through the same difficult situations as you. God may use that in your life. So certainly you don't have to leave just because it is hard. You can stay in it because the Word of God tells you that you're to stay in it. And God actually can show you His grace and mercy as you stay in it so He could give glory to God in how He rescued you in that specific circumstance of your life. Now, it does not mean, amen. amen. Now, it does not mean that we don't consider leaving that situation. You could. That's what Paul says. Hey, if it avails to you to do so, do it. But you are ultimately following God's leading. You do not get to determine the direction of your own life. Did you know that? Everywhere Jesus says, everywhere Jesus goes, Jesus says this, follow me. Follow me. That means what? He's always ahead of you. So you don't want to go anywhere where God isn't. You don't want to go anywhere where God didn't say, follow me. So when God doesn't say, follow me, when God says, hey, uh, if you're silent and he doesn't answer your prayer, what do you do? You wait. You wait. Right? God says yes or no or what? Wait. Three answers, not just yes or no. Some people, God didn't say yes or no. If God didn't say yes or no, God says what? Wait. Wait. Think about that. Okay, God is never really vague about his answer. If God didn't say yes or no, don't go anywhere. Wait. Do not run around like a chicken with a head cut off. So I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that, just see which one hits. No, God says, follow me. He's very, very specific about where he wants you to go. If he didn't tell you, wait, this is what's said in Psalm chapter 27, verse 13 through 14. God praises those who wait. I believe. 
I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Why do you think the psalmist always tell people to wait? Do you just read this and say, oh, that's kind of nice sentiment? No, God actually commands you to wait. Wait unto the Lord, and you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You feel like this is craziness, this is sadness, this is going to go downhill, and, but God didn't tell you to go anywhere. You don't have any clear direction. Wait, wait, and God will bring you where he calls you to be in his due time. Wait. So remain in the Lord. So here we're seeing God's instruction to us regarding our lives. We're to be content. We're to be seeking after the Lord in all areas of our lives, even in the current state of our lives. We're to be content in our church life. We're to be content in our secular work life. Ultimately, our heart attitude needs to be under this word, steadfast. This is something that we studied last week in our Bible study. What does it mean to be steadfast? Think of steadfast as immovable. It is immovable, but it's immovable for the right reasons. Steadfast is very, very different than being stubborn. You know that? Some people are stubborn. They say, I'm steadfast. No, you're just stubborn. Stubborn is when you want to do things your way. Steadfast, when you know a biblical principle in the Bible, you have faith in God. That's called steadfast. Okay? So many of us are stubborn. We think of ourselves as steadfast. You're not steadfast. You're stubborn because you have a habit of doing things your way, which you've done for a long period of time. That is not steadfast. You need to take counsel from other people. That is not steadfast. Steadfast is when you actually read the Word of God, you're confident in the Word of God, and you're hanging on to the rock of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 7 regarding two people who are building their two houses in very two different ways. Remember that story? Jesus said there's one person who built their house on what? On sand. When the winds came, when the floods came, when the rain fell, the house built on the foundation of sand, what, it ha- what, did, what happened to it? It washed away, right? It fell apart. But the house that is built on a rock, what happened to it? It stood. It stood all the tribulations. And Paul says this, and Jesus said this as well. You need to be that house built on rock. The rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rock of his word. The rock of his promises. And if you do so, you will see the goodness of the Lord. Psalm chapter 16, verse 8 through 9 says this. I've said the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand i will not be shaken therefore my heart is glad my whole being rejoices my flesh also dwells secure this is the heart attitude we need to have in every area of our lives let's pray our father we thank you for just this lesson we thank you lord for your grace in teaching us how we are to function in every arena every stage every setting of our lives in which we're not flustered, we're not afraid, we're not anxious, but we know, Lord, that even in this, you are still here. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you. We thank you, God, that you're the God who walks with us through all tribulations. We pray that whatever it is that you will have us to learn in the hard times which we're in, even this morning, which we're contemplating this message, we would be courageous enough to face it with the courage we, which you give to us. We know that we can. We know that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to, to, to do so. So we pray that you'll bless us and give us the conviction to withstand, to withstand, and to see the goodness of the Lord in the state which we are in. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.